row? I don't know. She's on vacation. Who knows? Um, so first, uh, we open the floor for public comment. I want to thank you, you gentlemen, for sacrificing this... your Saturday last week. Well, you're welcome. To be on the streets and the weather that was out there. <coughs> I also want to say I'm tired of having a dirty car for the past three, four summers because I can't wash it. We've had a water van for four summers running. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any connection between my dirty car and the 50 to 100 tractor trailer trucks I see coming out of industrial drive every day. Since they're full of Northampton water. I don't know how much, what the volume of... There's absolutely no connection between the two. Coca-Cola doesn't use that much water? They use quite a bit of water, but it doesn't come from the Mill River. Oh, I know that. It comes from the reservoir. It comes from the reservoir. It drains into the Mill River. Um, yeah. But we're not putting out water into the river from the reservoir. Beaver Brook eventually does go into the Mill River, which is the overflow from the um, uh, Mountain Street Reservoir. Pardon me? The, the state selected a rain gauge, on the, or a, a flow gauge on the Mill River as the trigger. Oh, I know that. I, mean, yeah. I just know you know, the water's coming from somewhere. <coughs> we're putting it in at the reservoir for not taking it out of the reservoir. It's dictated by our Water Management Act. It's got nothing to do with our actual, I shouldn't say nothing to do with our actual water supply. It does, they're connected, but our, our water supplies come from a completely different basin than the Mill River Basin. Well, because Northampton's is in the Mill River Basin, which is a medium stress basin, if I recall correctly, we have these permit conditions that we need to adhere to. All right, thank you. We're in the middle of the public comment period. No, I got here at the right time. It, I think you did. Uh, I'm Harriet Brickman of Bottoms Road, and the Bay State Association and its neighbors are interested in some clarification about the Clemens Street Bridge. Twenty years ago, we restored the bridge, and we were told at that time that with regular maintenance, we have it easily for 50 or 60 more years. So my initial question is, what constitutes regular maintenance and is there a maintenance schedule? Because 20 years ago, um, it became clear that to keep this bridge uh, was way preferable and way, way more economical than replacement. So we'd like to get some information uh, about maintenance on the Clemens Road Bridge. I've never seen a schedule for maintenance on any of the city bridges since I've been here. The, the problem, Harriet, is that Although it's true, replacement would be a much more expensive proposition. The state has a program where they will uh, pay for rest or replacement of bridges. Right. Unfortunately, when they do that, they want to meet all of the requirements. So there's got to be a sidewalk. There has to be room for two-way traffic. Yeah. It's got to be seismically strong enough for a 5.0 earthquake. I mean, there's a whole oh, litany. Yeah. And so what they would put in... At state expense, looks nothing like what the neighborhood would sure right. prefer. The state says that's fine. We're not twisting your arm. Mm -hmm. uh, the city can gold plate it for all the state is, uh, cares. Mm -hmm. It's our money, and they feel um, it's certainly our prerogative to fix it up any way we would like. But then we wind up in the, just an awful, like, would you lay off four teachers and two firemen and sell a police cruiser so that we could do X, X, and Y, and Z? Uh, it's just an awful... Well, the first question is simply, what, what constitutes regular maintenance? I mean, what are we talking about? And, uh, and, then, and then, what's the cost of that? You know, it, we, it may be nominal. I, I have no idea, but it seems to me that that needs to be looked at before... Um, you know, if we're talking about fifty thousand dollars a year, that's a whole lot different than a two million dollar bridge. Even if it comes from a different pocket, I mean, you know, that's that's already a, a tertiary question. So on this particular bridge, Green and Pedersen put out a report. I believe it was in two thousand eight. I just Seven. actually emailed it to two thousand eight. 
2007. Mm -hmm. I just emailed it to Alex Giesling and to Gary also. Um, because of the nature of that bridge, it needs to be basically, the rust needs to be taken down and repainted X number of years. Um, we recently have gotten a quote to do um, repainting of the hotel bridge up in Leeds as part of the uh, CPA project for the Leeds Civic Association. And they, they were quoted $600,000 just to paint that bridge. So it's, it's a very expensive bridge to repair, and the rust is back to where it was about five years ago when it got closed again. It's come back, and there is no maintenance budget to do that work. Well, it wasn't closed for rust five years ago. It was, the last time it was closed, it was closed because of rust on the cords, and they had to refix, they had yeah, to do some structural had, repairs, right, and yeah. they had to repaint them. Structural elements are rusting through on that bridge. Right. Bridges don't heal themselves. That bridge, I'll speak out of school a little bit here, that bridge is in tough, tough shape, and it's not going to last forever. And the Greenman-Peterson report outlined a series of um, projects that would need to be done um, you know, to keep it a viable bridge. And it was a lot of money, more money than the city has to invest in an old bridge like that. And I think a real hard decision needs to be made because over time you get these inspections and, you know, these older bridges, they just get, as time goes on, they get in worse and worse condition. And then, you know, big trucks drive over them and, you know, it's a real, it's a safety, it's a real safety issue. And, you know, it's a lovely old bridge and lots of historic value, but at some point somebody has to ask the question about if a big truck is going to drive across the river in that location, do you want it to get to the other side, or do you want a car to get to the other side? And if the answer is yes, then something needs to be done that's going to cost a fair amount of money. Uh, Harriet, about 10 years ago, we were talking about that bridge. And uh, we were talking about how we could reduce the load on the bridge, mm -hmm. see if we could coax it a little more life out of it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, You'll, you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is we are not allowed to keep trucks off of a, one of the city streets. We, we were talking about having a low bar, like a, a limbo bar, and you, if you couldn't get through the bar, you can, couldn't get on the bridge. Having it like, you know, set it eight or nine feet so that only cars could go below it. And then they come back with, what about UPS trucks? Well, you know, well we can post by weight. We already do that, right? It is. Yeah, it's it got is a weight limit on it. And in fact, the Mass DOT is reviewing the current weight limits now. They told us it would take them up to a year to come up with that reposting if there is one. So, do I understand your statement that that we're not allowed to restrict trucks off of certain travel ways in Northampton? Because there are neighborhoods where it, it says no trucks. That was my sense from our conversation. To do its truck exclusion, you have to apply that to the state for a complete truck exclusion, and it doesn't exclude certain types of optim I said not delivery trucks, but the moving truck that comes to your house. You can't restrict those kind of delivery type vehicles or service type vehicles from it unless it's done by weight classification. And currently, there are weight postings on the bridge, and I personally don't know whether or not they're being adhered to, but I know trucks do use it whether they're under the 17-ton posting, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. But it seems as if it, uh, if we're talking about trying to coax more light out of a bridge that's going to eventually fail, that we should be taking whatever steps we can to actually, I know we've exceeded the three minutes. Can I suggest that we put this on as a topic of discussion at our next meeting? Um. Because I do think it's a pretty reasonable question. And there must, you know, the state's holding us to a, you know, either we fix it at our, at, at our design standards, or it's all on your dime, and there's nothing that we're allowed to do to sort of uh, prolong the life of the bridge. It just seems like something that we should be able to argue back at that. Is there anything we could... Um I mean, I'm happy to put it on the agenda. I'm just wondering what we would talk about. Well, I think, you know, the question is, between the rock and the hard spot, is there any room to maneuver so that we can extend or try to extend the life 
of the existing bridge. And I, you know, it's posted for the, the trucks, you know. If we can take trucks off of that, if we reduce half the trucks or two-thirds of the trucks from traveling over it, it would have a meaningful impact on the life of the truck, or the life of the, the bridge. The bridge is going to continue to rust away underneath it until we take care of the rust. I know, I know you're looking at weight restrictions and trying to deal with that, but the fact is the bridge is rotting out underneath. And at some point, it's going to fail. When that is, is it 10 years down the road? Is it 3 years down the road? It's happening right now. The recent photos from 2012 from MassDOT show the level of corrosion that's happening that can be visually seen, not necessarily what's happening internal also. I think that just the nature of the way the building is constructed um, and when it was constructed and when it was designed to handle the kind of traffic and uh, I think the biggest thing that's changed is um, probably the weight of the vehicles going over it, number one, and number two, uh, traffic volumes, so frequency, so vibration, um, but I think probably most importantly is road treatment in wintertime. I don't think roads are salted and sanded the way we do today, 119 years ago. When I think of all of those exposed metal parts, all these joints where all the various pieces come together on pins, I think there's some like, like 11 pieces on one of the pins, some of nine, some of five, I can't remember. And it's all going like this. I can't imagine what paint would do. It's a really old I'm, steel bridge. I know. It's a steel bridge subject to winter, snow and ice, lots of crossings. I think the daily trips on Riverside Drive was 3,000 something. I don't know how many that would be on Clem Street, but at least a couple of thousand a day. I'm imagine. sure I'm sure Laura had some recent counts on it when yeah. we were looking at the truck exclusion route on it. Right, so I can see how the paint would help the stuff that doesn't move, but I think you, you paint those moving parts and the first day and the paint's already starting to come apart. And then you're subjected to salt. So, is it your sense that reducing traffic volume and weight on it would have no impact on extending the life? We would probably have some, but I think ultimately what I think what we're talking about is uh, just if you had no traffic on it and you did nothing, it's going to rot out. It's steel. Yeah. And if you throw a, a steel barrel into the woods, you eventually get nothing. Dust. Maybe it takes 20 years. We're talking about a bridge. Thanks. So all the focus right now is on the accelerated bridge program, which runs into 2016, and that's where all the money is going into bridges right now. The bridge is not in the accelerated program, so that no funds monies would be available to at least 2017 for this bridge from the state. If there was going to be a new bridge, or if they volunteered to reconstruct the bridge again, so. We're looking at at least another four years out before even a drop of state funds is available for anything. And this is why it's a local issue to deal with this and the fact that there might have to be a three to $500,000 investment put back into this bridge now, um, that's what needs to be discussed. And that's why I parted with um, Alice Giesen about setting up a community meeting in Bay State Village and start this process. Conversation has to start sometime. Well, and I would also say that the conversation should extend out farther because I think that that Clemens Street Bridge is a critical link to Cooley Dickinson Hospital and emergency from folks who live mm -hmm. out in the Ward 6 area. Mm -hmm. Where's that help? It's a start. <laughs> it's a start. I mean, a, a community meeting, I think, is. So we're waiting for the uh, state report? We week. have the state report from December 2012. I, think I thought there was one that was in process right now. There is, but that's a reevaluation of the, the weight limits, yes. which oh, should oh, be done all. within a year. That right. doesn't involve an inspection. Right, and we received that report sometime in March. It's typically three or four months after mm -hmm. the inspector we actually see the report and the issues. So it's been flagged to my attention that we have some critical work to do out there if, if we're going to proceed that route. It's a matter of, it's not in the FY14 capital plan. I'm committed to put the money in the FY15 plan for capital improvements, but there's no guarantee that the 
selection committee and or the city council is going to approve that. I think there's a question as well about, you know, you're talking about several hundred thousand dollars to repair the bridge, and one of the questions I have is exactly how much time are you buying that bridge by investing that amount of money? Um, I think there's a, there may be a point of limiting returns on this thing where you could pour a half a million bucks into that bridge and get three or five years, and you really, I mean, you really have to ask the question, is this the smart, right thing to do? And it's probably not going to be an easy meeting. Ned will go, I'll probably be at home that night and not have to deal with it, but... Um, the fact is, is that this bridge is in really tough shape, and then you really need to make a decision about cost, aesthetics, longevity, safety. I mean, all these things are really coming to a head at this point. That last bridge inspection shows continued deterioration. I, I did take a look at that inspection report when it came in. And, you know, the, when was that last bridge report that you're referring to? You were saying the inspection was done in 2012. December 2012, I believe. Yeah, the report, I think, was dated March of this year. It shows a very rusty bridge with There's members that are... Great details of the connections I was describing. Color photographs, and you can see it. Yeah. And, and if you just think about it, yeah. all these parts coming together in this pool, it's, it's like one link in the chain, and all of the parts are connected to that one link. And the link is obviously uh, steel on steel. There is no paint that you can put on there that would not get knocked off the first time a car went over. And just the whole undercarriage is just exposed steel. Now, the new bridges that have gone in recently are pre-cast, uh, pre-cast, pre-stressed concrete, concrete beams. beams that just You've seen drop on oh, those yeah. things. They're treated with silicone. They're going to last a very long time. And it's like an old house, and you could start working on it. You think you're going to spend a half a million dollars, and by the time you're done, it could be a lot more than that because you're exposing other issues as you start to take a, a closer look at your current yeah. construction. So. Yeah. Alex does have a copy of that, a PDF of that, oh, he that does? he could forward that to you. Oh, great. I sent that out um, today. Terrific. I will get it from him. Thank you. So do I, do I understand that we're talking about setting up a community meeting with the Bay State Village Association? I think that's what Alex agreed to do in the email, mm -hmm. I believe. I think that's where the conversation starts. Yeah. I think it's a great way to start it. There's, there's some clearly some political aspects to this. What do you mean? <clears throat> the funding is a political decision. How does a city want to spend that much money? Where, you know, where does the bridge fit in the panoply of things that the city needs to spend money on? Mm -hmm. um, your city council or the Bay State Civic Association, I mean, it's going to involve some decisions. The city will have to make some decisions about well, this is deja vu because we really went through this exact same process more, well, more than 20 years ago, yeah. 23, 24 years but ago. But the, the bridge is constantly deteriorating. Well, especially if you didn't care for it. But you can see from the, uh, the painting quotes for the hotel bridge that there's staggering amounts of money to keep it going. I wonder why painting is... I mean, I, 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 I understand now that, you know, we're not just, we may not just be talking about painting, but I wonder why the painting costs, why would that be so high? Well, you have to take the rust off, you have to yeah. control the debris coming into the river, so it's all uh -huh. collected by nets. Uh -huh. Any sandblasting that's done has to be, it can't go in the river. I see. There's a lot of environmental concerns with uh -huh. it, too. Probably lead paint, right? I'm sure it's lead paint. Yeah. yeah. And this bridge, probably not, but maybe yeah. a hotel bridge, yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Actually, probably not on Hotel Bridge, because that was reconstructed, I think, back in the late 70s. Yeah, there should be, and this was done 20 years ago. Yeah. So there's, there's no lead paint in residential paint. There's no lead in residential paint. It's still in the yellow chromium paint that you paint the lines on the street with. All right, well, thank you for thank coming you. in, and it sounds like... All right, next for your approval minutes of the June 12th uh, BPW meeting. Uh, any comments, thoughts, changes? Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes submitted? All right. Next, the July 10th BPW meeting. Move approval. 
Again, any comments or changes? All in favor of approving these methods? Aye. Finally, the May 18th BPW meeting. Hearing. Pardon me? That was a private hearing. Ways hearing. hearing. Oh, hearing. Sorry. Check. Move approval. Hearing. Second. All in favor of approving these minutes? Aye. 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 Great. You're doing good work. Three sets. Many minutes. Nice comments. I have stayed in that last week. Okay, next we need a date for a claims committee meeting. Um, we're going to meet on the 14th. Five and five fifteen. Uh, which is there just one, uh, two, 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 two here. Yeah. So. Five, 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 five. Contract for polymer to Aries Chemical in the amount of eighteen thousand seven hundred dollars. This is this is the annual contract for the water treatment plant. Um, last year's price was a dollar sixty one a pound. This year's low bid is one seventeen a pound. So once again, we see another reduction in our chemical purchases for this year. We have three bidders. Bidders range from low bidders eighteen thousand seven hundred twenty dollars to a high of thirty six thousand dollars. All in favor of approving this contract? Aye. Uh, next change order number one to um, contract 298-12 for phase one and follow-up dam inspections, the GZA. Uh, this is a time extension only. Move approval. Second. Change order, time extension, GZA dam inspections. Um, the work on the scope of work is pretty much done. I think we have a an invoice that needs to be paid, and we're having just the paperwork issue with the the, um, the completion date for the contract having been ta having passed. So we need to extend it and pay the, the last bill. Okay. All in favor of extending this contract? Aye. Aye. Change order number one to contract 310-11 for comprehensive wastewater management planning to Kleinfelder in the amount of. Oh, oh, oh. oh, time extension only. Also. So um, let me step back for a second on these time extensions. You saw a few of these at your last board meeting. We're seeing them again. The other office has flagged outstanding contracts that we're still working on, but the time that we originally estimated is out. So they've asked us to update these and get time extension contracts on them so that they uh, can pay the bills, basically. So this is another one. Uh, we thought this work would be completed sometime uh, this year, and it looks like we're going to be out for another six or eight months to get this project done. Therefore, time extension. And we're putting it up to the end of next year just to be safe. Okay. All in favor of approving this contract? Aye. Aye. Or extending it. Uh, next contract for emergency sewer repair at 130 South Main Street to Gomes Construction. In the amount of thirty-four thousand three hundred. This is a uh, emergency repair that we received a waiver for uh, procurement from the state. On we have a house service that's severed. Uh, the line's twenty feet deep. We can't repair it internal to our DPW. We don't have the equipment, so we put this out to bid. We received one quote from Gomes to do the work, and this is the number that they came in. So we don't have a backhoe, well actually I'll put all the equipment together, 20 foot deep. We don't have the expertise to go down that far with yeah. shoring and devices. This is for one house? Yes. Where's South Main Street? It is at the corner just past the new bank in Goggins Real Estate. It goes down to Petrol Street, or um, Street. Oh, okay. Elm Street, non right. Street. Um, okay. All in favor of approving this contract for emergency sewer repair? Aye. Aye. Uh, next contract for paving, uh, 
pavement marking paint to Enos Flint in the amount of $22,500. This is to purchase our white, yellow, white and yellow paint and also the glass beads we use for reflectivity. Uh, the prices have gone down on the, uh, the paint. Uh, white paint was $10.45 last year. This year it's $10.20 a gallon. Yellow paint went from ten sixty a gallon to ten thirty a gallon. However, the beads went up from forty one cents a pound to fifty cents a pound. Uh, this is uh, we have a paint machine uh, that we do all the center line striping and white fog lines, and that's what this is for. And over the years, we've talked about different paints, and plastics, especially for crosswalks. I know, but is this still the best product? Uh, Price-wise, yes. Longevity-wise, no. We have to paint every year, but thermal plastic has a lifespan of about five years also. It's about five times the cost. So it's kind of, which way are we going to go? Uh, we have the equipment to do it in-house, so we don't have to pay wage rates to do it by a private contractor. Mm -hmm. So there's some savings there. But if we're doing it every year, labor costs, we're paying labor costs every year. We are paying labor costs, but they're built into our budget. So instead of doing the labor cost once every five years with a more durable paint, we're doing it every year with a less expensive paint. Because mm -hmm. we don't have the funds to spend that kind of money on thermal plastic. I mean, we'd be looking at uh, one, it had to be probably a capital improvements, and we're probably looking at, I would say minimum, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars to do the city streets. The, the, um, this might be off topic, but there's been some new striping and signage Pine and Prospect is that? I sent out an email in regards to that. That was a mass DOT project for the 600 and something most dangerous intersect or high crash intersections in the Commonwealth. And we were allowed, we actually had six, and they did all this enhanced marking and signage as part of that project um, on the state's nickel, not ours. There was only six intersections? There were six <coughs> intersections that were five that had more than. Nine crashes over three years. It seems like I've seen them. I noticed them. Uh, it's like you have fog lines and center lines about 50 feet from the yep. intersection on all four corners. And I think there's more than six intersections. Maybe you've maybe been doing other intersections in house. Mm, not from my knowledge. No? No. Are you sure you guys ever get out? I ride a bike, you know, I see this stuff. <laughs> you drink a lot of coffee, do you? Okay. okay. I don't get enough coffee. So anyways, there was uh, six intersections that uh, we asked the state to do underneath this program uh, that were identified. There's supposed to be some their statistics that there would be a approximately a 40% reduction in crashes at these particular intersections. One of the intersections, we're actually going to be working on a temporary four-way stop, right? which is the Woodlawn, Jackson, oh, yeah. Prospect Street. I think that was the first one I noticed. Yeah. So that, um, hopefully by mid-August, we will have a a temporary 120 day stop sign there right. for an experiment. Um, and that stuff is thermal plastic paint, I believe. That's what they did? I don't know offhand. I think it is. Right? It, it looks, it looks, it looks like, like it's plastic. thermal plastic. Yeah, it does. All right, so all in favor of approving the contract for pavement marking paint? Aye. 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 Contract for Forest Main Design and Construction Services to Woodward and Kern in the amount of $21,700. This is a contract for design and construction management services to replace the Forest Main that runs from the Bradford Street pump station uh, along Woodmont Road up to North Street. It's about 1,000 feet of Forest Main. Um, the current Forest Main is a 10 inch asbestos cement pipe that was installed around 1971. We had a, a break of that pipe in a sensitive location crossing a culvert um, uh, three or four weeks ago, I guess. And we, we are concerned about the, uh, the integrity of asbestos cement pipe in the long run here as a force main. And given the, the importance of the force main to the uh, servicing the industrial park and the high amount of flow that it takes, we are looking at trying to replace that as soon as we can. Um, I have requested proposals from five engineering firms um, to do the design and uh, construction services work. 
Um, proposals went to Stantec, CDM, Wood and Curran, Kleinfelder, and Tyne Bond. Um, Wood and Curran had the lowest price proposal at $21,797, and Kleinfelder had the highest cost proposal at $63,300. Um, I reviewed the proposals and the wooded and current proposal what related to me and the good rates and good estimate and things in order to do the work. So um, that's what the contract is. This is a permanent replacement. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any questions or comments? All in favor of approving the contract for force main design and construction? Aye. Aye. Next contract for wastewater treatment plant clarifier number three. Water treatment plant? Water treatment, water, one W, <laughs> for chemically treated water line repair to Barbado construction, the amount of 4400 This is a, an emergency bid that we did to repair um, the chemically treated uh, water line that goes into one of the upflow clarifiers at the water treatment plant. Um, it is a uh, there's a spool piece there that's leaking that cannot be repaired or plugged um, in any way that's effective. So the spool piece needs to be pulled out and replaced. And um, we have requested emergency procurement through Joe Cook and the state in order to try to get this done as soon as possible because we're having um, some operational issues at the plant because of the uh, need to keep this clarifier offline. So um, the state approved emergency procurement. We put together a, a bid package and requested bids from five qualified contractors, uh, McEwen Construction, uh, Nickerson, Barbado Construction, R.H. White Construction, and the West Construction Corp. Um, we had two no bids. Barbado Construction was below $4,452, which is the contract we're asking uh, for approval. Uh, R.H. White bid $6,750, and West Construction Corp. bid $37,600. So we had a, a pretty good range. The, um, the engineer's estimate, Hayden Howard did an estimate for us, and they thought it would be about a $22,000 job. So we're quite pleased with the, uh, with the low bid. So. Wow. It is. Um, I think the issue here is that it's an emergency repair work. We're stipulating that the work has to be done by August 16th. They had to prepare the bid in a week. It's a big rush. Um, West Construction Corp obviously put in, if we're going to inconvenience their people and that sort of thing, they want to get paid for it. Um, it looks like the Barbado and White Construction estimates were a little more true to what their actual cost would be to come out and, and, and take the full piece out and put a new one in. So we're pretty happy with the bid. So we're looking at. Have we done business with them before? We have not. Um, do we know anything about them? We do. The the firms that we sent the bids to were recommended to us by Tate and Howard, who has a lot of experience in treatment plant construction. So they were sort of pre-screened before we sent it out. Thank you. So all in favor of approving this contract for the water line repair? Aye. Aye. Change order number one to contract 254-13 for residential food waste collection program. Um, contract is with our, our alternative recycling. We're going to extend the contract until the end of this year. Move approval. So this is another time extension only contract. Um, this is for the composting that we do here. Not on site, but the collection of it, they take out to a farm out in Belcher Town for composting. So it's part of the program we offer the, the residents who use our transfer station here with their permits. So all in favor of extending this contract? Aye. Aye. Great. Finally, change order number one to contract 311-13 for emergency sewer repair at the 53 Gothic Street with John Kinkoffs and Sons, $2,300. Move Second. When we put out this emergency contract, we thought all the work would be done by, um, I believe, the end of July. There's still some small work to be done and the bill to be paid. That's why we asked for an extension of contract. The work is done at this point. All in favor of extending this contract? 
Aye. 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 Great. Uh, we reserve for topics that shared but not reasonably anticipated would be discussed. I don't have anything for you. Is anyone have new business that should come up now? Okay. Staff, that's not for me Usually it's something that the last minute come in from staff. All right. Uh, okay. We're not last minute. <laughs> okay. Oh, well planned out. <coughs> Excellent. So, stormwater and flood control update. Um, so, I I wrote down some notes. I'm actually creating a, an email I want to send to the to everybody, um, including the task force members, to make sure that they feel like I'm. I'm summarizing their position, so I, I want to make sure that they feel fairly summarized. Luckily, Chris is here to listen to this list and tell me if he thinks I'm speaking out of turn at all. The task force feels that establishing a fee system is the most practical way to tackle the city's, the city's stormwater and flood control obligations. The task force did not take a stand on the amount of the budget. They took that as a, they took the amount we provided them as a given. However, the question before them was, what's the best way for the city to tackle expenses of that magnitude? Uh, the task force feels every property owner should get a bill, should participate in the expense. City property will be exempt from the fee. The task force feels that the city council should have final authority over setting the annual budget. The task force feels the city council should have the final authority over setting the annual budget. Uh, whether the Board of Public Works or the Department of Public Works recommends uh, what the budget might be, regardless, the city council is the one who will make the final decision. Which is the same as the present enterprise funds? Mm, only in, less directly. I mean, we, we set the water rate, the sewer rate, that's built into the budgets by the staff, and ultimately the city council does approve the budgets. But by then, our the rates that we've set have been sort of woven all through the budgets. But do they also have to approve the rates? No. So, so we saying? so on, on, on water, sewer, and solid waste, we set the rates. We set the tip fees, or we were setting the tip fees, the water rates. So, David, to David's point, this is a change in the way we're doing our enterprise. Yes, this would be a new, a, a new approach. And it would be to have the city council essentially set the budget that we recommend for the enterprise fund, mm -hmm. which they don't do for the other three enterprise funds. Correct. And this would happen annually? Yes. So, in a sense, the task force accepted uh, a round number of $2 million and sort of worked with that uh, in terms of modeling what a particular scheme would really how a particular scheme would distribute the bill. Mm -hmm. What would it, what would my my house cost mm -hmm. if it was a two million dollar annual budget? Mm -hmm. um, but the as I said, the task force doesn't take ownership of that two million dollar number. They didn't dig into that. Uh, is it one point eight? Is it two point one? Is it one point five? They're not. As David Teese explained, they're not taking ownership of that number. Mm -hmm. Yes. And being an enterprise fund, the way they were regulated or set up, two million is just the first year. So we may discover after a year or two that it's not enough or it's more than enough and we can change rates well, to it. Interestingly, the next, the next point uh, speaks to that. I'm sorry, I spoke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the task force feels there should be a cap on the growth of the fee, at least for the first few years. Um, I don't know if a number of years was discussed. 
three to five was thrown out. Um, I think there was general agreement that the cap would phase out. Uh, the amount of the cap, this is a cap on growth, similar to Proposition two and a half. That that idea was thrown around. I don't think two and a half is necessarily carved in stone, but the idea is that they would like the fee to be fairly stable, at least for the end of the beginning. Um, there was some discussion about having some kind of an override, and I'm, I'm doing little quotes on that override feature if there's an emergency, if we had a huge flood, if there was damage to the dikes, if you know something totally unforeseen came up. There was discussion about some kind of an override, maybe a super majority of the city council, or maybe it goes to a typical override, such as the one we just passed. There's some discussion about what happens if, you know, the dikes fall over or something like that. Uh, but nothing was decided. So city council sets the, the budget, cap on the growth for the first few years, loose discussion about whether there might be some way to handle totally unexpected occurrences. Regarding the details of the fee structure, how do we determine what Roe pays, what Terry pays, what Gary pays? Um, task Force came up with two models. One model is the equivalent residential unit. So you calculate the cost for a house, and then you that becomes the unit of currency, and then everyone gets a bill based on your you're the equivalent of six and a half houses, your car dealership is fifteen point three houses, and that becomes the unit of everything. Uh, that's basically a, a pavement model. The more pavement you have, the more you pay. The alternative method was that hydraulic acreage model, <coughs> where the nature of your property is assessed and it's divided into impervious sections, impervious sections, and you get differing rates depending on what uh, the makeup of your property is. The task force preferred that type of model but they forwarded both ideas. Um, I think the task force agrees that we should create standardized fees for small residential properties. Um, some people thought that having under half an acre, half an acre to an acre, one to two acres, something like that would work. Some people thought, oh, let's just call it one flat residential fee. There's some discussion about that, um, but I think broadly speaking, the task force agrees that there should be standardized residential fees so that we're not comparing bills with our next door neighbor on both sides. And, oh, you're paying $5 more. Well, I'm paying, you know. We'd like to get out of that level of detail. So that would be for all sizes of houses? Well, that's, let me circle back to that. Okay. Uh, the task force has some concern about balancing fees so that the burden doesn't fall too heavily on the commercial sector. Uh, they wouldn't want this to be the sort of thing that might discourage commercial growth, investment in commercial real estate, uh, job creation, that sort of thing. And finally, at least finally as in terms of what I've got in this little document, uh, task force feels that we need to create a system of credits uh, as an incentive to encourage best practices perhaps uh, also some kind of an income, a low income uh, program for helping people who, for whom this uh, fee would be a, a difficult burden. So that's, that's what we have. I think that, does that all, Anthony, you seen? Yep. So, <clears throat> so they brought us this document. Now the city council has uh, thank the task force for their work, and they're moving toward referring the document to us. Uh, it got held up in a procedural um, question at the last city council meeting. Uh, three city councilors have called me, including the one who held it up on the procedural motion, and to say, we'll work this out, don't worry about it, you guys get to work. So the intention is that the Board of Public Works and the Department of Public Works keep
keep working on this through the summer. Uh, the, we have two models for distributing the fees. Somehow they, they need to be joined. We have a clear recommendation that there be credits and, uh, as incentives, but there's no specifics to that proposal. Um, it's, a, it's a great idea, but now what? We need to put some meat on the bone, as I said last time. Um, those two areas, melding those two models and creating a system of credits, are the part that I think the board can spend our, can best spend our time on. Uh, other parts of this are more mechanical. Um, the, the thrust of what we want to do is put together the framework for a prospective ordinance. So there are technical parts to this. How would the billing structure look like? I don't know if that would make it in an ordinance or not. Probably not. There's a technical part of it that I've never seen uh, of, of an ordinance. You know, the, the sort of thing that goes to the city council. We'll need the staff's help and maybe even the city solicitor's help. Uh, Jesse Adams, I guess, is uh, pretty good with this stuff. Yeah, I think it's probably going to be a combination of looking at uh, stormwater ordinances in other communities and also the city of Northampton ordinances that we have for the water and sewer system, right? I mean, we have there's right. a basic outline in the ordinances now for the other utilities that the city manages. So um, it would be a combination of those, incorporating information from the task force and whatever the board comes up with or and the council comes up with the final recommendations on the fee and the credits and that sort of thing. So there are, part, there are parts about this that I don't think require a whole lot of discussion or a subcommittee. Like, I think if we were to make the case that, no, 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 we should set the, the budget, I think we'd be spinning our wheels. We'd get nowhere with it. There's not much to talk about there. The task force was pretty clear. And I think the city council is in agreement that they would like to set the budget. So not much to talk about. Certainly no need to have a subcommittee to review that part of this. Uh, the billing structure um, looks pretty straightforward. Uh, should it be a an enterprise fund or some kind of a revolving account? Again, from what I'm told by the DOR, it's a pretty cut and dry decision. It should be an enterprise fund. So there are, par there are parts to this that just don't need a lot of board time and really don't even need that much staff time. The only two pieces that I can come up with that we could really dig our teeth into our what's the model for distributing the fee and what about this credit thing? How can we make, what can we come up with that's practical and, and feasible for credits? Okay. Um, can you give us a sense of timeline that we're looking at? I mean, when are we looking for the, when do we need the first bills to be paid? I mean, of course you were pretty well, clear if you, about us if you look, the money now. All right, they would like and how do we then back that up into sort of a decision-making timeline for us? The, the hope is that in FY15, beginning so July of next summer, 2014. about a year from now, the, the idea is, well, hope, the hope is that a year from now, this, this can be up and running. So it would be... So in order to build the budget for FY15, Susan Wright and the mayor and the staff would like to be able to get to work on this sometime in January. Uh, that means you kind of start working backwards. The city council needs to address this November, December, October, you know, but some, sometime in the late fall, early winter. Um, you keep working backwards. They, it has to come out of ordinance committee back to the full city council. We're getting back toward Labor Day when they have to begin chewing on this. Okay. So we're looking to, for something to come out of our work relatively quickly by the end of August. Yes. Okay. And I've committed us to have, to sponsoring a public uh, informational session early in September. The other question I had is I know that when we hired the consultants to draft the original, to do the original work on this, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the implementation phase. Is there any part of that contract that's still alive and valid with them, and are we relying on any outside consultants to work us through this public process? Because I remember a review process that some of the consultants we looked at, we, I 
thought that we engaged them because they seemed to be pretty effective in the public presentation of whether or not we were still into any of those contracts. Those contracts are all gone and done at this point. Okay. And the full scope of services were performed on those? Yeah. So it was only... Actually, the, 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 the only thing that didn't happen was we held the public hearings without CDM on this public information meetings. CDM actually wished they could get more money. I don't know. They, they, they felt they went above and beyond in doing that work. So my question is, you've answered it. The, the scope of services that we have with the engineering firm to do the early part of the work is done and over. Yeah. And okay. it's on us to move it forward. Correct. Correct. Um, so I want to start with the easier one first. Why did the task force not come up with specific exemptions? And is that appropriate for staff to propose to us? Exemption or model? Both. I think it was just a, a greater level of detail than the task force really had time to get into. Mm -hmm. Actually, Chris had done a fair amount of digging on credits and exemptions and there was information in there task force report about um, an overview of those sorts of things, but clearly I think the task force did a great job at, at hitting the big things that needed to be decided, but there were some other things like the details of the credit system that were just beyond what they had really the time or expertise to do, so it seems like something that would, you know, needs to be worked out and presented to the city council, I think, is, you know, what, what aspects of the program are going to be touched by credits or exemptions. If you think about something like a drainage swale, like that thing in front of the Gazette, mm -hmm. there's an engineering aspect to it. You, If we're going to give a property owner credit, you have to say, well, it's effective. Is, is the sizing appropriate for the drainage area? Um, you know, exactly how well does it build? Where are the specs? There's, a, there's like a kind of technical things to it. And then there's an issue of maintenance. It's, it quickly starts to silt in. I mean, all, the first time it rains, mm -hmm. and how long will it be, remain effective? It's like a, a ton, turns out there's a ton of detail to it, and um, and that's just for one thing. And I think the task force just didn't. Mm -hmm. okay, so I understand that, but is it appropriate for us to ask the the, the uh, DPW staff to come up with proposals for us? I think so. Uh, do you, by the way, do you mind if Doug moves up the mic's chair? That's a good idea. He's, I was going to suggest. He's yeah. he's uh. Maybe up in a moment. Maybe you're looking for more money if we let him sit at the table. Now. <laughs> <laughs> we know as much as my no, the yeah. intangible <laughs> perks are just as valuable. As money. Yeah. 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 It all uh, speaks to job satisfaction. But we have, we have operations and maintenance agreements on some of those stormwater systems. Too. You administer them, you monitor them every year, they, or at least you collect the reports every year. Mm -hmm. So they do. There is some paperwork that those are projects that have since 2004 applied for stormwater permits. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, there's a lot out there. That mm -hmm. I was just going to speak to the Will's comment about potential credits and having staff work up on something. We've done a fair amount of reading and research, as I mentioned, Chris has done on. Um, communities in New England, the types of credits they have, um, what may or may not work here in Northampton, what we feel, what staff feels is practical or impractical. Um, there are some credit systems that are being used out in different parts of the country that are just kind of crazy, to be honest with you, in terms of implementing and making sure that they work. They seem to be really um, impossible to manage. But there are other credit programs that are pretty straightforward and, and look like they're fairly readily implementable. Um, and there are some decisions about whether credits get phased out or um, what the value, the maximum value of a credit is, whether res residential properties can get a credit or only commercial industrial properties. So there's a number of things that um, we could pull together sort of a summary for the board to look at if you wanted to go that route and just say, you know, these are some things that people have done. These are things that staff would recommend as being, um, from an operation standpoint, implementable and, and make sense. Um, so we'd be happy to do that, but ultimately decisions about whether things uh, run, you know, whether the, the credits 
run out over a period of time or they get phased out or whether there are O&M requirements for those or what the maximum amount of credit is, those sorts of things. Um, you know, clearly the board would need to come all over that and make some recommendations on it. So every, it's, every community is a little bit, when you go through these credit programs, you know, there's no two that are, that are the same. So I think every every community wrestles with, well, what do we want for our utility? You know, what is the what are the things that make sense? How much time can we dedicate to these? You know, those sorts of things. And um, it's it's very similar in a way to the way the task force um, wrangled with setting the fee structure. I mean, the, the task force their recommended hydraulic acreage thing um, is something different. It's not exactly like anything else. I mean, it's it's comparable to what other communities have done in some locations, but the specifics of the calculations are unique, and you know, really nothing wrong with that. But it shows that every town has to make you know, their own decisions about how to run the utility. The the city council is going to want examples. Um, for example, speaking about credits, yeah. but the ordinance won't be so specifically written that particular credits will be written into the ordinance. So it, it, the details are sort of a living thing. We may phase out some credits that looked great to begin with but turn out over time to be less useful. We may think of new, better ways of doing them, so we'll introduce some new credits over time that weren't in our original package of credits available. Um, so won't, I don't believe the ordinance will be so specifically written that it will uh, mention specific credit opportunities, but as I say, I'm sure the city council will want some solid examples of what we have in mind and what we think the credit credits might amount to as a percentage of, in, of our gross income. Yeah, I mean that, that's one of the that's one of the, the the factors that we'll have to consider, which is what's it going to do to revenues, how how big is it going to be. Um, the other one is. Um, a decision about what your goals of your credit program is. Is it to um, increase public participation and enthusiasm for it? Is it, in which case you want it to be as broadly applicable as possible, um, even if it was financially not all that significant? Or do you want it to, um, and a lot of communities have followed this model, reduce the burden on the stormwater and drainage system, either through qualitative or quantitative reductions in, in the amount of water that's entering the system and how polluted it is. Richmond, for instance, provides um, up to 100% uh, credit for commercial entities that pre-treat their water before it enters the system because they've got a specific issue with regard to a river that they want to keep clean. So, you know, as Jim points out, each each community is going to be somewhat unique in what it, its approach to that issue is, depending on what its goals for, for it are. And we're going to, you know, we're going to want to spend some time thinking about it. But it does seem that, that, I mean, we've got this ordinance that we need to do, and then there's a second level of detail that really, sort of the rules and regulations of what we're going to be, the operational details behind how we're recommending that the fee is laid out, charged, and opportunity for credit. So, like you said, I don't think there'll be that level of detail in the ordinance, but that there'll be a, sec a second set of detailed information that we will create. This is, this is how, it, how we intend to operate. The city council will reasonably look for examples, I think, and heading into a public meeting in September. They sure will. Um, and it'd be great to give them concrete examples. When you were uh, going through your overview, you suggested that our job would be to meld the two models. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious why you, why you make that statement. Why would we not go with one model or another? Or if, if you um, if you look carefully at the models uh, and kind of extend the thinking out in each case, they start they actually can kind of come together. They almost meet at some point. Um, they're picking one doesn't necessarily, particularly the hydraulic acreage. Jim can speak to this more clearly than I, but um, they're not mutually exclusive. But they do need to be brought together. Yeah, I think that there's uh, there are some common um, common.
common themes among these among these two models and and uh, Doug and I were actually had a conversation near the end of the task force suggesting that if the task force had a few more meetings they may have naturally taken those two models and sort of made one um, because there are some overlap overlapping thinking and certain assumptions that go into them the overall sharing of um, the fees and the revenues are, are fairly comparable between the two um, so I think when you look in, at the inner workings of them that they're not uh, that far apart from each other but um, in either case, I feel like there are a number of assumptions that went into the models that um, need to be considered further. There's some little things that need to be ironed out if you pick one model or the other and if you start playing around with them, you might find that they, you know, they, they look pretty similar. Uh, but there are some, I would, I would say that there are some awkward things with each model that need to be worked out. Can you elaborate on that? Um, or Doug, or I mean, it's each model involves making. There's a number of assumptions that went into every model, mm -hmm. and because they didn't have an unlimited amount of time to look at each assumption and look at what the impact of changing changing an assumption is, um, where they put their pencil down wasn't necessarily at the end. Mm -hmm. um, there's one little blip in the hydraulic acreage model where. Um, the fee for a two-family house is actually less than the fee for a single-family home. I don't think anybody in the task force is really comfortable with that, but they didn't really have the time to go back. And um, actually, in the very last meeting, I think Dan Felton was playing around with the spreadsheet on his laptop, saying, "Well, I can change this number, and yeah, that'll make that go up, and this will go down, and we can do that." And that type of fiddling, I think, still needs to be done to make to make these uh, to make the models what people think they should be. I don't think anybody was happy with that two-family. People kind of going crazy about them in the task force, I think, that why is it two-family less? People aren't going to understand that. It doesn't make any sense. And it's based on an assumption that needed to be reviewed. You know, there's a number of, a number of those factors in there. Another one on the, on the hydraulic acreage model is um, there's a factor for impervious area, a runoff factor of 0.7 that was used, and there's a a factor for buildings that was used at point nine. And um, when I look at that, well, I guess regardless of what I think, the, the, the impervious number point seven was picked, and it sort of builds in the assumption that um, some properties with a lot of impervious may already have detention basins or some other stormwater mm -hmm. mitigation system. So it sort of a, assumes that mm -hmm. there's some stormwater mitigation happening. Mm -hmm. So in a way, there's like a credit that's already being built in for pervious mm -hmm. for impervious area. So to me, I don't, if you're going to have a credit program, you know, maybe you don't want that to be 0 0.7. I mean, the real number for that might be 0 0.9. So maybe the maybe the building uh, impervious coefficient and the impervious pavement coefficient would both be 0 0.9 instead of two different numbers. So it's things like that that I think you know the board could consider as it makes sense. And if you do make those the same, then you end up with two factors. And, that, and it starts to look a little bit more like the ERU model, which was the other one that they had recommended. So, you know, you can see that things start to, they could be simplified and get a little bit closer. But, um, no, they're all built on these sorts of assumptions, and they could be considered further or kept the way they are, you know, whatever. But I think some of them definitely need to be thought about a little bit further. There's another, uh, Jim and I were working on another <coughs> approach that never saw the light of day. It's a variation on the hydraulic acreage. Um, so if you say 0.9, you're saying that 90% of the water that falls on a roof is going to shed off of the roof. It won't penetrate into the ground. Well, hopefully the number is even higher than 90%, but that's a number. 70%, 0 0.7 is 70%. Part of the challenge is you have to come up with numbers that can be if you're going to call it a runoff coefficient, they have to be numbers that are supported, broadly supported throughout the industry. You can't call it a runoff coefficient and say it's a 0.4. Like, well, what's that? I haven't seen that in the literature. Rainwater is different. So, so what? What I was trying to struggle and come up with, I didn't get it done in time. But Dan Felton says actually there's some support for this in the literature is to stop calling it a, a runoff coefficient, call it a development factor. Um, and I, 
And then suddenly you can start using coefficients to achieve ends that everyone would agree are desirable ends. Like how do we evaluate forest land? I mean, forest land is good. We're all in favor of forest land or conservation land. We, there are people who donate substantial sums of money to increase conservation land. If we give that a, develop, a favorable development factor, um, then we can reward people for making those decisions. The way the hydraulic acreage does is that they just pull the number out of thin air and say, that's the number, that's the dollar amount that we will charge. Uh, it, well, they just it up to, to buildings being more... Well, they just pick the number. Investment. Yes, yeah. I understand. And, right. and there was a range there. But they at least had the beginnings of some underlying yeah. theory. They were struggling with, uh, and Dan, I think, in particular, was struggling with, but I don't mean to single him out, tying flood control with the property safety, um, preserving property, saving property from the hazards of flood. And whereas in the, you know, an open field, it could flood, and the flood water goes away, and you're none the worse for the wear. Um, I mean, they, they're just, they were struggling with, you know, how do, how do we evaluate all of this? But the flood comes from stormwater. But not our so anyway, my, my point is that there's lots, there's lots of wrestling, but all of this, all of the models have some arbitrary. At some point, you make an assumption, and the, using development factors is no more uh, more less no less valid, I think, than just picking a number and saying that's how much we'll charge those properties. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the, the pollution factor in terms of the pervious. The stuff that comes off of pervious tends to be dirtier than the stuff that runs off your mm -hmm. roof. Mm -hmm. That is dirtier than what would come out of a, a forest. Right. So, you know, with a development factor. You can reflect those values. Yeah. So, so there's work to be done there. There's work to be done on credits. The rest of it, and I'm open to your thoughts, but the rest of it seems to fall out pretty simply. What's the billing look like? Who sets the rate? I mean, who sets the uh, the budget? Um, cap on growth of the budget. Uh, the task force agreed there would be a fee. You know, have to revisit that. Okay. Both, both in both models, every house would be treated the same. The fee for every house would be the same. <coughs> I think there's broad agreement that there'll be standardized fees for residential. Now, will there be a half and under, one half to one, one to two, or will it be just one for all houses, or all houses under three acres? We could talk about that. So it's not a single fee per house. It's, uh, it's whatever. It's multiple fees, right. whether they're two or three or four or five. Dwelling yeah. units, or you mean for dwelling unit as opposed to a house? I was speaking no, of houses. Two, so if there's yeah. a two-family house, that will be... They recommended a standard fee for a single-family house, a standard fee for a two-family house, and a standard fee for a three-family house. Anything with more units than that would be calculated um, per development. Um, there was a lot of discussion early in the task force about breaking a single-family home into different tiers based on the overall property size, which is what Terry was kind of getting at. Sort of a tiered system within a single-family house system to reflect a house on a really large lot versus a house on a smaller lot to try to make that more equitable. The final recommendations didn't include that, but there was a great deal of um, support for that concept in the early models. Yeah. Well, I think that's really necessary because otherwise you can have the smallest houses being the same as a house that's six, eight, maybe ten times or, as impervious. It's, it's going to be a political issue. I mean, I, I agree with you about that. And it also relates to the to the question of uh, dealing with the needy, so to speak, and and it, it might be automatically built into the small house charge as compared to the large house charge. Well, since we're going down, since we're going down the path, I I did have a question about with our GIS system and with our assessor data, 
why we couldn't refine the data more specifically. In terms of doing a play every lot? Yeah. Um, that question came up with the task force. We were pretty resistant to it, I think, to the I chagrin of, of some of the people in the task force. I think but we, we feel like um, the amount of effort to do every single lot in the city would be overwhelming. And the expectation is that once, if, if you're a homeowner, and the expectation is that the calculation for your lot is going to be very specific, um, then it needs to be very accurate. And then if someone, what if someone builds a little bigger driveway, they put a shed on there, they put they build a little addition on their house, then once the database is, is set up, which could take a lot of money to figure it out, then you'd be spending tons of hours every year keeping it up to date for every little change in impervious area. Um, we had um, one of the residents in town, Fred Zimlar, came to every meeting, provided a lot of good input and comment, but you know, one of the things that he did was like, you know, I went out and measured my driveway in my house and, and I'm trying to figure this out and it doesn't, you know, it's different than what the average is. I'm like, well, yeah, it, it, it is, but I mean, the point was well taken that if everybody went out there um, and measured the impervious area on, on their own lot, we would have hundreds of disputes about bills every year because people wouldn't agree with the number. So many, many communities um, do an average, um, as, as the task force had recommended, using GIS data, which we feel is, GIS data is the most accurate, the most readily available, and, and what we recommend be used for, the, for this purpose. And I understand, and a lot of the literature reflected exactly what you said. My concern is an equitable issue. Um, the idea that if I have a big two-car garage and a playhouse and a lot of, if, and, and a very developed driveway. And a tennis court. And a swimming pool. I, you know, I think that the, the, the answer to that really is, is taking a step back and looking at you know, the, the bills that are recommended here, for example, the hydraulic acreage model, the, the bill for a single family home was $144 a year. So even if you were to spend $100,000 figuring out the impervious on every lot, you're only talking about a few dollars one way or another for a single family property. So it almost doesn't make sense to dedicate the resources to come up with, you know, my bill at my place is, you know, 100 and Fifteen dollars, and the city sends you a bill for one seventeen. Or you know, you're really spending a lot of money splitting hairs on a very small percentage of a bill. So you know, on gross level, when you talk about it, someone's got a big house, someone has a smaller house, someone has a long driveway, somebody doesn't have a long driveway. In in the big in the big picture, in terms of the order of magnitude of the bill, you know, it's really it doesn't make a lot of difference. So the average seems to be. Um, the most universal way that utilities seem to deal with it. Um, using the tiers, I think, is a little more equitable. People love the tiers in the task force. I mean, it was really most of them. The early models that were coming out were tiered. I mean, yeah, and the city or the Chamber of Commerce supports uh, tiers. Mm -hmm. And then the tiered thing, if you look at a the street, they're usually fairly homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Everyone right. on the street, your neighbor right. on both sides have the same bill. Well, maybe, well, the, yeah. maybe the people up on, you know, Audubon have a different bill, but in that case, they have the same bill as their neighbors. I, I there's also the, the shared, you know, there's, there's your lot that impacts the stormwater system, but you're also using the road and the, the larger system. So there's the shared, huh. that's, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that an average bill reflects mm -hmm. that a little more. And it's, it's not a different thing just based on your property. Well, just keep in mind when we get some wording down so that we have a defensible response. Mm -hmm. So, create a unified model, credits, I think those are the two things. Um, when you say credits, you're really referring to ECIs? Yes. Exemptions, credits, and incentives. Yes. Credits and incentives, I, I think there's so much overlap there, I think it's just too really much. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase but without, without a real name. What I tried to do was, and there's no, there's no sort of industry standard for what is what. Um, I just wanted to indicate that I thought that some of these are going to be 
small sort of homeowner type one-off things, your rain bucket kind of thing, as yeah. opposed to um, you know maintaining swale and getting it permitted and re-inspected and blah 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 blah, which would be slightly slightly different. Right. And exemptions are you know I mean I don't I don't I, I include them because they come up from time to time, but other than the city, I don't see us actually. I, I'm not a big fan of exemptions. So, I was thinking of a couple of subgroups. Um, what do you think about creating two little subgroups to work on these two issues? They're the, as I say, they're the only two issues that seem to make good use of our time. Or yes? That does sound like a good idea. Can you finish with your thought? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. My only concern is it does seem like, like I don't want to be reinventing the wheel, and if the staff has done a lot of work on this already, that if, like, Gary and I were on one of the staff groups, we'd really be hoping that Jim and Doug would be giving us a lot of the information, and then we would just be... Yeah, reacting, I, which I think is the value of a civilian board of directors. Yeah, okay. I mean, Staff gives us ideas, and okay. we say, oh, we like this one more than that. Right. Okay, you're, so you're saying that's exactly what you are thinking would yeah. be a good thing, and then we would come to the whole board. Right. Okay. Just clarify. I was going to say, you know, I look at it like the subcommittee on the transfer station operations. I mean, it was so effective where we had just identified a bunch of options, and we brought it before you know, MJ and, and you, Ro, and I forget who else was on there, Mike or David, or, or whatever, but... We just brought a lot of information, and then you just sort of do it and say, well, we think this makes sense, this makes sense, and then that's what ended up being recommended to the full board and what was implemented. And I see it, you know, this being something similar, where we could certainly do a lot of the, the legwork and presenting information to you to decide what you like or don't like. I know Chris would like to be on I'm all about exemptions. <laughs> you just said you don't believe in exemptions. Yeah, I see. You just think it ought to be there. Yeah. It looks good. No, because I mean, you know, what we did was in looking at options was we looked at what all other communities, their decision making process was and, mm -hmm. and how it fits with us. So, um, you know, that, so yeah, I'm I think it makes sense. Forward with that. I like the idea of giving the public some incentives and the rain barrel thing. But ultimately, Everyone has to pay in, right? So if you start with a vacant lot, it's still going to have runoff. Mm -hmm. well, especially and, in heavy rain. Yeah, yeah. and we do winter. have the Connecticut River that could flood downtown. So that has nothing to do with it. So would you like to be on this committee? Sure. Excellent. What was the other choice? Uh, yeah. Melding the two firing squad. Firing squad? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with the incentive committee. Then. He's, he's the, uh, um, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, snacks would we have on <laughs> No. <laughs> Chocolate croissant oh, on, yeah. on right. the other I'm one. Not on yours. <laughs> My daughter's a nurse, and she was uh, recently on a committee with um, some doctors, and uh, she was so amazed she took a picture. At the doctor's meeting, they had beer and sandwiches. The nurses were that she showed the picture to were like, Stunned. Why? Had no idea. Well, the doctors, you know, the nurses, they'd have water from the drinking fountain, and that'd be about it. <laughs> so, you know, you'll have to work on your committee. We don't do whatever you want. It's fine. <laughs> the doctors are there fundraising. I guess. Doug's treat. I mean, you know, Doug is a member of the We don't drink beer here. No. Wine. David and MJ, do you have any? I'd, I'd like to see the mer I'd like to be involved in the merging of the teams very seriously. Because okay. I think there's a lot. It's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Same. Big group on this. Okay. <laughs> I don't Mike is. Um, <laughs> uh, Mike is away. He's got a two-week vacation, and he's got a one week now of vacation, but he'll be away. Let's give him a bye. Yeah. 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 <laughs> He'll want to know, but... Oh, yeah. Actually, he would have... He was... He's sorry to have missed it. Yeah. Uh, but between now and uh, the end of August is pretty much out of action. And we are 
down the phone floor on August 19th to have a conversation with the joint committee on where we're heading with it. Yes, and uh, so the city council was going to officially ask this group to work, begin this work. And it was um, post ask this, the request was postponed at the last moment uh, due to a request for a minority reconsideration. Owen Freeman Daniels thought that the city council could be um, perhaps more involved in, in, this, in this process. Uh, although, He's not positive. Just, just one little time to think about it. So three city councilors have told me, look, you guys get going, inclu including Owen. Uh, it's more they're just thinking about it, mm -hmm. thinking about how best to be involved. But it's possible they'll want us to give them some updates at their August meeting. Mm -hmm. Their August meeting, the city council's August meeting? Because mm. we did have it, it is an agenda item for the August 19th. Joint committee that right. was delayed by a week, so we'd have a second board of public works meeting. So. And is there? Yeah, I think the uh, we'll city council is the fifteenth. Well, we moved the joint committee to the nineteenth. It would usually be the twelfth, but we wanted it to be after the DPW DPW meeting on the fourteenth. Mm -hmm. City council is first and third Thursdays of the month. I think they might have some something mm -hmm. going on though. In August. Okay, something different? Yeah. Okay. Summer session? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you say yes? Yeah, they usually always in the summer only meet once a month. Yeah. Like June, July, and August, so. Yeah. I, the 15th sticks my mind, but I may be wrong. Um, that's actually what I had in my calendar. So we'll have to figure that out. It's possible they'll want a little bit of an update. So, Gary, Chris, Doug, credit, incentives, and exemptions, CSRs. ECIs. This, ECIs. Yeah. CSI, crime scene investigation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, and this group with Jim. Oh, Jim, you'll probably want to go to all of you. I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> You're trying to make up private. Hey, listen, I don't feel bad about that. I, I, I was not crying by not making all the meetings on Saturday. I was not at home crying because they didn't invite me. But he was following us on Google Earth. Oh, that's where they must be right now. <laughs> I was with them. Oh. It was a great experience, and I'm glad it's over. Okay, so, so do you want to make so let's should we make a date? Yeah, we have to make a date for uh, these. You guys want to huddle right now, and we'll huddle. They have to be so we'll, are you on the rate? Are you on the rate subcommittee? What are you? You're just gonna float? Because you I'll, I'll be home crying because I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all posted, so everybody's welcome to come to them anyway. Um, but they're also staff involved. So. So you need time before you present to even us. You know what? Okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to meet tomorrow morning. Either. I wouldn't want to meet tomorrow morning either. Me either. So Next week would be fine. Next week. Next week. Sure. Looks like, what are you going to have me? Doug does all the work on this, just the, like the heavy thinking. So I'll so be quick to offer you. I'm just going to throw out a date. Thursday morning, <laughs> the it's easy for August me. 1st. Yeah, that'd be good. How about uh, nothing earlier? I may be going to Boston. August 1st, I go to Puerto Rico. Are we talking about the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. No, I'd love to do that. 29th, 30th. So it works for you. 29th. I can't think of 31st. I don't know yet. I'll be going to Boston either the 1st or the 2nd for a meeting about the Rockford Police Department. I'm going to do the 29th. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be going to Oh, yeah, I can't. Because I have to be in the morning meeting. So, 8.30? 8.30? The 29th? 8.30, so I can 
Sweet. Oh, it's too so early. <laughs> In Italy, it's already done. What about a credit team? Did you pick a date? We're when working on it. When would we meet? In the morning? Whatever yeah. works for you guys. 8.30 here. How are you? 29 staff meetings are pretty early. Quick. Oh, I usually have staff I usually walk the dogs then, but I can walk the dogs anytime. Monday. Or we said 8.30, right? 8.30. 8.30. Okay. I'll switch off the phone or something. Monday would be a bad choice just because I have no idea. Yeah. So for sites on this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When do we call in this stuff? This is the fee. Here. What are we calling it? Fee subcommittee? Fee development subcommittee. These are public meetings. Is that enough time? So, why don't you say when? When? Well, Monday the 29th at 7.30. Yeah. Um, so, that's the 30th? Yeah. Okay. Oh, the first is, the, 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 is Wednesday. It's, what time? Okay. It's Wednesday. No, it's not enough time because it has to be posted. Oh, yeah. Because it's a public meeting. Yeah. 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 It's not enough time because it has to be posted. 48 business hours. They're not going to post it at 8.30. They don't come in until 9 o'clock. Well, yeah, I mean, the agenda would have to be done, and city clerk has to agree to post it. <laughs> what, wait, what date was that for? That you couldn't? Monday. If you sell it, it's over $40. Where? Yeah. Yeah. So tomorrow morning is the 25th. Right. One. <clears throat> if we have a one line agenda it's item discussion of credits, incentives, the other one's discussion of fees, one line agendas. But the posting's the issue. The posting's the issue. They don't oh. come in until 9, Ned. We're and I have to the ask them first. to That's do right. it We're immediately. Fine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know what? This is a volunteer group. It's not calendar hours. It's they're not business hours that were open. Because if you did it tomorrow morning, they post it on a Friday. Business uh, hours, yeah. then. It's not. Weekends don't count. What if you're doing a private way hearing on Saturday? Take credit for the Saturday if you put it on. No. Yeah. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, we should get comp time or something. Yeah, yeah. So, what do we need to do? Yeah, pick another day or move the meeting to line? <laughs> and if we happen to show up earlier? Moving the meeting tonight's okay. To 9 is okay with me if it works for you. Yeah, as long as I can use my button. I have to wait for a 10 15 or staff meeting to start. Oh, yeah, I don't think it'll. I don't think it'll take Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, I'll smoke so cigars and we'll, we'll make a smoke oh, we'll so we Yeah, it's really oh. right Let me get it straight, though, okay? <laughs> um, it's going to be the Board of Public Works fee... Subcommittee discussing... Subcommittee. Stormwater rate structure. Stormwater fee rate structure. Stormwater fee development. Rate structure. Rate structure? SFRS. Or it come up with a better acronym. Fee structure. And that's going to be 729 mm -hmm. at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. okay. And the other one? Wednesday the 31st, but I didn't hear a time yet. 730 a.m. 730 a.m. Can I just give you this one? Yep. Okay. And what, do you, what are your initials, your acronym? <coughs> ECI Task Force Subcommittee. Subcommittee. Exemptions, Credit, and Incentive Subcommittee. Yeah. Icky. 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 <laughs> we could have gone with ICE. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. And you're meeting 
things are going to be an hour long? Yes. Make a motion, Major. Did anyone? I could go around the table. So oh. You don't often sit here, Doug. Is there anything on your mind? Anything you want to do? It's your big chance. It's your chance. Big chance. All right. Lots of big guns. Ned, how about you? I want to thank the Board of Public Works for all your work on private ways and the time you dedicated to this process. We got through 45 private ways. Um, basically, every street that we currently do, some form of snow and ice removal has been looked at. And um, you know, we're just waiting for the next process, but your public process is over at this point, so as far as I know, unless someone files another petition, there won't be one coming through this office for any other streets. So I just want to say thank you. It's, uh, it's a lot of work on your part. It was a great experience. I like it. Was. it was, I really yeah, enjoyed it. Fun. it was uh, having been thinking about this for about 10 years. And yeah. A long time. It, it really was nice to finally get something yeah. concrete and done through. That thing was just a matter of jumping off the cliff and going for it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Jim? couple things. We have a, a bid document out to bid started today to do some uh, repair work on the Mill River levy system. The board might be interested to know. We did find some uh, capital funding of $250,000 for uh, repair to the levy. So we've got a, a document out to bid right now on that. What kind so of this is talking about? It's mainly uh, clearing, rubbing, levy repair, seeding, some concrete, uh, concrete repair work. Some other different types of stuff. It's a lot of odd, kind of odds and ends types of, types of things. And these are these projects address the cores, Army cores. They start to. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Where did the money come from? Capital improvements from this capital improvements from about four years ago. There was two hundred fifty thousand dollars set aside for drainage in the city to look at, and so this was actually looked at and programmed for this particular project. Mm -hmm. At least to kick it off anyways. It's going to be more than 250 I believe, but at the end. So you said this is the Mill River levy, so this would be from Paradise Pond Dam down to Route 10? That stretch? Yeah, there. some of it's along the diversion canal as well, so on the other side. Yeah. Well, both sides of the river, mm -hmm. but that's the section of the river. It is. Yeah. And the other thing I want to do is thank Ned. He gave me last the last board meeting off. I took my wife to dinner on her birthday. She was quite pleased. So I want to thank him for letting me take the evening off and do some sagging. Yeah. Where'd you go? We went to Coco in East Hampton, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. First time we've been there. So if you haven't been, I want to recommend it. Did you have it? It's all good? All good. All good. Okay. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't want to say no, go ahead. Thank you, Motion Major. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone.